All right, you can start. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight with the Explorers Club. Our program on to higher exploration personal recycling is something that's near and dear to my heart. My name is Jonathan Leader. I am an elected fellow national explorer for the club. And with me tonight is a fairly distinguished uh, panel of individuals who are directly involved in the questions of green and natural burials. And this has become a very important issue, uh, both here in the United States and abroad. Each year, American burials as a group, as an aggregate, use over 827,000 gallons of toxic chemicals and 1.6 million tons of concrete. Every conventional burial contributes to the production of about 230 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent. And every cremation is equivalent to driving 600 miles, producing about 150 pounds of carbon dioxide per body burned. Green burials aim to eliminate most, if not all, of the pollution created from a traditional burial service, funeral service, by foregoing embalming and opting to bury bodies in shrouds or caskets or other materials which are biodegradable, sustainable, and, well, let's be clear, climate friendly. This is something that we are all going to have to deal with one way or the other. So before we get into that part, I think it's important for us to have an understanding of how we are where we are. So there are a couple of different forms of burial that are out there, which are fairly common. The ones I think that most of us are familiar with are in-ground burial. That's usually with a casket or a vault, sometimes both, sometimes required to be both, in a fairly traditional cemetery. You have above-ground uh, burials. Uh, probably the most famous for most people are the mausoleums in New Orleans. Cremation, I think most of us understand. Uh, but you also have sky burials. This is one that people tend to overlook. It is still very traditional in many places. And this is the exposure of the body either on a raised platform or on the side of a mountain as it happens in Tibet. And natural elements, animals, birds, and the rest scavenge the body, leaving bones behind, which may or may not then be collected and put aside. And then, of course, you have natural burial. And natural burial is one that Jews and Muslims and many other groups have traditionally, which is there is no embalming, but the body is shrouded and put either directly into the ground in a shroud or put in the ground in a casket, uh, which is made out of wood or some other material, which is designed not to have anything attached to it, which would normally you know, remain. So the idea is, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, soil to soil, and there you go. So those are the ones that I think that people are mostly familiar with. But where we got to where we are today is in part, part of our Protestant background, which was that people tended to be buried on top of each other in small areas. Uh, and it was really, truly unhygienic. Cemeteries were noisome, unpleasant places. Uh, this is back before about 1831. So prior to that, they weren't the greatest places. As an archaeologist, I can tell you there are lots of places where that was not the case. Ossuaries, secondary burials, and the rest. But in terms of the West, where most of us are residing, we're listening to this, but not all, uh, this situation shifted right about 1831. The rural cemetery movement was designed to do a couple different things. One, it was to move bodies out of the city on property that was actually very important for industrialization and other you know, urban pursuits, but also tying in with a romantic movement, which moved people back to the utopian visions of the countryside. So people would go out and be placed on hillsides in fairly elaborate settings, uh, ponds, uh, shrubs, you know, parks. And indeed, some of our first parks in the United States are actually cemeteries. They were not designed as parks, they were designed as park cemeteries. So this is the rural cemetery movement uh, about 1831 to roughly 1900. The one that came after that, which I think more people truly are familiar with, is the Lawn Park Cemetery. These are the smaller cemeteries. They're not as grandiose as some of the, uh, you know, the rural movement ones were, but still the monuments are upright. Uh, they are lots of them, statuary, mausoleums, above ground, below ground, tablatures, all this is in place. And that's what most of us think of when we think of it. Halloween wasn't that long ago. Thanksgiving was last week. And usually when people think cemetery, what they're looking at is either rural or lawn with lots of monuments and stuff on it. And occasionally the stuff that came before. 
But the main point was the Long uh, Park cemeteries were smaller scale, smaller scale, uh, and not quite so picturesque. <laughs> the one that we most often see today is what's referred to as a memorial park. And that's with the very flat tablature, a bronze plaque, something else, flat to the ground. So what you lose when you look across it, you get the lawn that you had from the lawn, you know, park cemetery movement. But now it really does look like a lawn. In fact, uh, looks like a golf course not infrequently, uh, with uh, with might might as well be letter boxes in it. Okay, but the thing to keep in mind is that all of these are <coughs> dressing on the cake. They're the icing. They're not actually the cake itself. The cake itself is what we started off with. It's tons of concrete. It's embalming chemicals and the rest. Uh, it is unsustainable, ungreen, and honestly, not earth friendly. So we're fortunate tonight, very fortunate tonight, to have three leading lights in the Green Burial Movement who will discuss what they do. And then at the end of that, we'll have a little bit of discussion as a panel and we will open up to questions. So I would like to uh, turn first, I believe, uh, to Dean. Hi, Dean. How are you tonight? Hi, good. Uh, Dean is a remarkable fellow. Hopefully you read his bio, but if you did not, when it comes to alkaline hydrolysis, uh, Dean is your man. He can tell you everything about it. He's written a good chunk of the papers. He is the person to turn to. So I'm going to turn to you, Dean. You're on. Can you please tell us about what you do? Yeah, very good. Th thank you for that introduction, Jonathan. I'm going to share my screen here. So you can see, and I have a talk here. There we go. So um, I'm going to speak to you guys tonight about alkaline hydrolysis as an eco-friendly, gen gentler alternative to regular cremation, or <clears throat> to flame cremation. And now I'm stuck. There we go. So I, I also want to let you know that I've, I've had the privilege to work both at the Mayo Clinic for 20 years on the left-hand side there, and I worked at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA for another 12 years. So this whole project started back in about 2005 um, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and then I was able to take it on to UCLA. I ran the donated body programs in these two um, great cities and great institutions. So this has a 15-year excellent uh, record. So. First of all, I want everybody to understand our carbon footprint. And in funeral service, we call it the body to bones process. And whether we decide to be buried um, and we use embalming and, and a vault and a casket and clothing and climate, or whether we decide to be cremated, um, it would take different times. And, and you can see the different elements that it actually takes during those times. What I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about is actual the cremation here. And we're gonna compare the flame cremation to the actual water cremation. As you can see with the flame cremation here, they, they use natural gas or propane and it, it creates 534, about 535 pounds of carbon dioxide per body, just so you know. And then you can see the byproducts of it here. And then you can also see uh, with water cremation, we actually use potassium hydro hydroxide, and it's the same potassium that makes up 2.5% of the Earth's crust. So I'll go to the next slide here. So what actually happens during the process is the body is actually placed on a tray here inside of a unit. It's actually, there's load sensors on the unit that actually weigh the body. And that puts the right amount of water in there, and it also puts the right amount of potassium hydroxide in there. So what we're doing is we're taking what happens naturally in the earth over months or years, and we're accelerating that into just a matter of hours. And we have a pump that just circulates during the process. We heat this entire process up to 302 degrees. So it it's actually under pressure, so it's not a boiling process, but it, but it creates about 65 to 70 pounds of pressure, which is equivalent to about two car tires. So as far as comparing the two, um, if you were going to plan your, your funeral this way or your cremation this way, there's three main differences. You'll see that, that here, one uses 95% the potassium hydroxide, 5% 
potassium hydroxide, excuse me, and pacemakers need to be removed with flame cremation because they will explode and they could they could actually burn your your uh, crematory or your your entire funeral home down. And finally, bone fragments need to be dried. Otherwise, we're pretty much um, the same on both sides here. So attached to the actual alkaline hydrolysis unit is what we call an automated skid with accessory tanks or a treatment tank. So all of the fluid from the actual process goes into a treatment tank. There's also an alkali tank that contains the potassium hydroxide. There's a neutralizing tank over on this side here that actually brings the pH down um, to an acceptable level by the municipality. And then there's an energy reclaim tank. So since we're heating to 302 degrees, we have to bring that temperature back down to under 212, which is boiling. So that water goes back into this tank, which can then be poured onto the rinse cycle, or it can start the next cycle. So I'm gonna walk you through a quick cycle here. So what we do is we wrap the bodies in a bioplastic, and these are normally made out of cornstarch. We can actually use natural fibers such as silk, wool, wool or leather, and they will um, decompose during the process also. We um, place the body on the tray here, as you can see. We have a self-sealing door. This is actually a British nuclear submarine door on this unit here that we use both at Mayo and at UCLA. So this allows the water to move freely around the body, which also helps break down the, the tissues. We enter the weight, the gender, whether it's a male or a female, and whether it's been embalmed or not embalmed, because that will take a little bit more chemical and a little bit more time depending on those parameters. Then this is what the finished product looks like right here. We've got sterile cremains with no DNA remaining in them. It's pure white calcium bone fragments. Those bone fragments are then taken out and they're allowed to dry. And then they're placed in standard crematory um, equipment that actually pulverizes the bone. It's, it's called a processor, but it actually pulverizes the bone and it grinds it down into a pure white calcium phosphate. And that's what we actually give back to the family of the cremated remains. And the cremated remains, since we're actually skeletizing the body instead of burning the body, we actually have about 33% more ash or cremated remains to give back to the family. So in one in three, we actually have to use an oversized urn to actually place the ashes in. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the liquid effluent here. And here you can um, also see this is actually a pH um, scale here. And if you remember back in chemistry class, water is neutral at 7. A strong base goes to 14 and a strong acid goes to 0. We start at about approximately 13 and a half or 14 here. But you can see the different chemicals that are here that are either acidic or basic. So what happens is, is that the body breaks the chemical down to around 12 or 11 and a half, but usually the, mun the municipalities want us to be between 11 and five. So what we do is we drip a little bit of acid back into there before we release it. So on the back of our, our skid tank, we actually have temperature sensors back there. We have a pH meter that reads the pH and then we have a sample port so the city or the municipality can come and test any time that they would like. And then this is actually a picture of the manhole cover. So what we're doing is we're creating a soap that actually cleans the sanitary sewer system as it goes down the, the drain. And there's approximately 270 gallons per cycle. So for a family of four in the United States, it's usually around 250 gallons per day of actual water that we use, but we use about 270 gallons per cycle of water, just to give you an idea of the actual amount of water that, that goes back to the recycling plant. And in the big scheme of water recycling, like in Los Angeles, the Hyperion plant, they, they handle around 500 million gallons of water a day. So this is just a tiny, tiny amount of water. Last but not least, I want to talk to you about implants real quick. And, and as we continue to live longer, our bodies 
become biohazards. You know, we end up with communicable diseases and cancers and prescription medications, chemotherapy, radiation, all of these types of different things. And, and during this whole process, burying or, or burning these affects our groundwater and our air. Now with alkaline hydrolysis, all of this can be treated. You can see the mercury amalgam from dental fillings. It doesn't get burned. It doesn't go into the atmosphere. It doesn't go into the groundwater. These can be taken out and they can be recycled. Also the prosthetics in the body. These are all polycarbons that most crematories don't even know about. We have hernia meshes here. We have bladder incontinence. We have, we put plastics in our body here through implants, all these types of different things. We have bone cement from implants in there. Even fake fingernails you can see right here and some glass eyeballs. These are all things that we that come out of that machine every time we open up the door. And this is these are all the heavy metals that go into cremation that we're also placing in the atmosphere. The, all of these are brand new and they look you can still read the serial numbers when we open them up. So in conclusion, I just want to let you know that we destroy pathogens, we protect the operator, and we turn, return a safe byproduct to the family. There's no DNA left over. There's kinder and gentler than flame cremation at 1800 to 2000 degrees. It's environmentally friendly in that it, there's no mercury amalgam admitted into the atmosphere. Our carbon emissions are much lower. We use an eighth of the energy than a flame crematory. There's no groundwater contamination. Pacemakers and implants can be left in, and we use a base solution, potassium hydroxide, which is commonly found in water recycling. And the water is sent for treatment and is e easily recyclable. Recyclable. The implants are recyclable also. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or you want to contact me, here's my contact info. So thank you, Jonathan, for this opportunity. Got to remember not to mute myself. So thank you, Dean. I really appreciate that. That was that was that was good. It was coaching. It was direct. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is uh, Anna. Uh, Anna Swenson. Again, I hope you read her bio. But if you didn't, uh, I find that Anna's group is very interesting as well uh, because they've taken a very different look at how to do things, and it's basically based on composting, which a lot of us do in our backyards. In fact, I've considered talking to my daughters, since both of them have compost, uh, that when my time comes, they may just want to put me out there with the uh, coffee grounds and the potato peels. But I think we'll let uh, have Anna explain this at a greater level of uh, understanding. So Anna, could you please? Thank you for that, Jonathan. And I just want to let you know right away that it is not legal to do this yourself at home. This is an ah. industrial process that we have spent uh, over a decade um, perfecting and legalizing and getting licenses for. So it's informed by the same principles and it's the same biological processes, but unfortunately not something you can do at home at this point. So thanks everyone. And thank you to our last speaker for telling us about alkaline hydrolysis. This is sort of a corollary process to that. It also uses one eighth the energy of burial or cremation. And I'm here to tell you about the science and the impact. Um, I'm here from Recompose. We are the first full service funeral home to offer human composting. We're based here in Seattle, Washington, but we can accept bodies from all over the world. And there's my info and our website if you'd like more information. So just to tell you a little bit about how this process works, the official legal and scientific name for this process is called natural organic reduction. And we actually didn't use the phrase human composting for the first several years of our organization because it did give people that mind of, oh, this is a smelly bucket on my counter. This isn't necessarily a safe and honoring way to care for my loved one. But now we've seen a lot of adoption and actually a lot of excitement from people who are composters themselves who like this idea of doing it for themselves. So just to take you through how this works, if we start up at the top of this little clock looking diagram at the pile of wood chips, natural organic reductions takes place when we place each body on a pile of wood chips, alfalfa and straw. And then we place the body and the plant material into what we call a vessel. That's that little honeycomb shaped machine at the number three of the process. So this is a bit like alkaline hydrolysis in that the body is placed on a tray. We use the plant material and it's the 
naturally occurring microbes on that plant material and on and in our bodies that power the transformation into soil. So the body and the plant material remain in the vessel for 30 days. And during that time, the microbes create heat of over 131 degrees Fahrenheit. The law here in Washington requires that it stay that hot for at least 72 consecutive hours. And ours actually reaches that threshold many times over in that 30 days. And that's how we know that everything in the vessel is being broken down, including pharmaceuticals, including chemotherapy, they are transformed at a molecular level. So after that 30 days, the soil is removed from the vessel. It's then dried for another six to eight weeks. We also screen for the types of implants that were mentioned in the last presentation to make sure that all those are out. And then we also test it for various different levels such as um, fecal coliform and that kind of thing to make sure that it's all safe before it goes back to families. And then the soil can be used on trees and plants. We also offer the opportunity to donate it to our conservation forest partner here where it's used on Rest restoring land, for example, where invasive species have been re removed. Um, here we have invasive Himalayan blackberries. So our conservation forest partner uses this on plants that are replanted in that area. So you can see from this diagram that it's a true returning to the earth. The trees that grow from the soil could then become wood chips to then continue the literal returning of, to the earth. And that's one reason that this resonates with people. So this is a picture of the open vessel. This is what it actually looks like at our facility down in Kent, Washington. And I put this slide in to make sure that I said everything. <laughs> looks like I got it. Um, I also want to mention that there are a few fairly rare conditions that disqualify a person from choosing human composting. One is Ebola. One is prion diseases. One is tuberculosis, and the last one is radiation seed treatment. Either the organ has to be removed or the person is not eligible for this process within 30 days of receiving treatment. Uh, people always ask about COVID and people who have COVID or die from COVID can undergo this process because the COVID virus can't survive that 131 degrees Fahrenheit. And also the process takes six to eight weeks total. So that, you know, the, it would, it's not a risk to anyone working on the soil or the soil at the end. So that's an overview of the process. This is a photo of the little 64 ounce box of soil that we give back to families. And then this is the soil that's been donated to our conservation forest. We call it Bells Mountain. It's down in Southern Washington. Families can take home the entire volume of soil. It creates about a cubic yard of soil per body. And that's because the plant material that goes into the vessel is about three cubic yards. So if you're familiar with composting, you know that it's uh, sort of a concentration of all of those nutrients. So folks can either take it home and we have about half of folks do choose to take it home or they can donate it and then receive this 64 ounce box, which is sort of like the equivalent of an urn and scatter it on trees and plants. And a couple reasons that people like this is that we can use it, it's, you know, meaningful use and rather than being uh, sort of considered a waste object after you die, you can actually give back to the earth. And our CEO, Katrina Spade, calls this being useful one last time. Although I did have a woman at an event come up to me and say, I'm tired. I don't want to be useful anymore. So, you know, it's all in how you look at it. This is a photo of Mount St. Helens from our Bells Mountain Forest. And I love this photo because it really emphasizes the return to the collective after a life of being an individual. I think that's something really beautiful about this process. And this is what I've chosen for myself is to donate my soil out to the forest. And sometimes I kind of feel like it's something to look forward to. So just to give you a context of what this costs, um, there are many providers for alkaline hydrolysis and there are only a couple for human composting right now. Um, this is based on Seattle prices. These, the price for death care varies wildly and I'm sure other speakers can speak to this, but the recomposed price is $5,500 and that includes transformation into soil, the opportunity to keep or donate your soil, transport within the Seattle area. And then we also offer a funeral that we call a laying in that's live streamed from our current location. We're also opening a larger location here in Seattle uh, in March or April, and that will also be able to have live 
ceremonies like funerals. And we are also planning to open in Colorado by the end of this year. We're also working to legalize this process in several other states, including New York. There are a couple of peccadillos to death care law in New York that um, are gonna take some navigating, but we really wanna make this available everywhere there are people who want it. So this is a photo of the, we call this the vessel array. This is the front stack of vessels. We have the capacity to turn 16 vessels. We can turn 16 people per month into soil. And we've turned over a hundred people into soil so far. And we also have a prepayment option called pre-compose. And we have almost a thousand people who have chosen us for their future death care. So it's been exciting to see this spread. I was Recompose's first employee in 2019 and it's we've really done a lot since then. As I mentioned, we have a laying in ceremony. Um, this is a couple of pillows, but this is what it would look like if a body had plant material placed over it and then placed into the vessel. And we can do this in many different kinds of ways. We've had Catholic priests, we've had full military honors, but we also have a nature and we call it the carbon cycle ceremony. And that involves lighting a candle to call to mind sunlight. It is breathing for respiration. So that's something that our services team of funeral directors wrote to bring the biological process that's happening also into the ceremonial aspect of what we do. So yeah, I just like to mention people are always like, well, how do I get it? What happens when I die? If you're here in Washington, you can just give us a call and we have our regular phone number and our licensed staff can help you. But if you're in another state, you can also give us a call, but it's usually what happens is that you will work with the funeral home in your state to transport your body to us here in Washington. And then our team will pick you up at the airport. So we are a licensed funeral home. We operate just like every other funeral home. Uh, this is one of our people, Amigo Bob. He was a composter and a soil defender in his life, and he actually got to learn about what was going to happen to his body when he was alive. His story was featured in People magazine over the summer, and I love what his wife, Jennifer Bliss, said when she came to pick up his soil. She recognized it. She really felt like, oh, he's coming home with me, and I missed him during that month that he was transforming into soil, and I love that idea. So, um, as I mentioned, this process, like alkaline hydrolysis, uses one eighth the energy of burial cremation. And for each person who chooses it, one metric ton of CO2 is saved from entering the environment. That's because there, it, we don't use the fossil gas required by cremation. And there also is some carbon sequestration in the soil created. Um, there are lots of reasons that people choose this, one being the environmental impact. There's also the opportunity to return to nature. A lot of people who have been gardeners or hikers or naturalists or explorers in their life like the idea of truly returning to the earth. So just to give you some context of how much one metric ton of CO2 is, my, this is, comes from an EPA calculator. My favorite number on here is this 40 propane cylinders. You can picture one a barbecue cylinder, a backyard filled with 40 of them, the impact really starts to add up. And we've already composted 100 people, so it's, the impact really scales over time. So that's an overview of what we're doing here at Recompose and human composting. Thank you all for taking the time and thank you to my fellow presenters for your work in eco burial as well. Okay, well, thank you, Anna. Greatly appreciated that. Uh, it is interesting. I, I actually never occurred to me that there'd be a marketing issue or people would be upset with the concept of human composting. They have to use a different term, but I'm glad that we've gotten that one straightened out and they've gone back to it. One of the issues you did bring up, we will bring up to the panel as a group, and that is the question of accessibility to truly green burials across the United States, because not everything is available in every place. And there are reasons for that that you folks have a great deal of background experience in, which probably considerably more than I do. So we're going to bring that one up as a question. That's a spoiler alert. Uh, however, our next uh, speaker, Ed Bixby, actually has a very interesting background, uh, both in real estate and in building and in landscaping and some other things. And uh, he will be directly involved in another version of Green Burial here. And I'm really looking very forward to hearing what you have to say, Ed. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take it away. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank the Explorers Club for this opportunity and thank you, Dean and Anna, for the great presentations. Uh, I'm Edward Fox Bixby and I'm the president of the Green Burial Council. Uh, uh, I've been a certified member of the Green Burial Council since 2007 and a board member since 2011 and the president since 2014. I'm also the owner and operator of Destination Destiny Memorials, America's premier eco-friendly funeral provider. I've been a natural burial operator and owner since 2007, and I currently own and operate 11 natural burial facilities nationally and internationally. I'm here tonight proudly representing the Green Burial Council, uh, which was founded in 2005. So just to let the uh, viewers know who the Green Burial Council is and what that means, the Green Burial Council is a nonprofit uh, C6 provider certification program. When I say provider certification, we certify funeral providers. And we also have a nonprofit C3, which promotes and educates the consumer uh, about natural burial and its best practices. The, the Green Burial Council itself certifies cemeteries, funeral directors, and products. And the Green Burial Council has strict requirements in place to ensure best practices, which protect the consumers from greenwashing while educating the industry and holding those to the highest standards and requirements concerning natural burial. The Green Burial Council is currently recognized as the gatekeepers of eco-friendly funeral options and education. So that would bring me to my next uh, part of my subject matter would be natural burial. What does that mean? Uh, a natural burial means no embalmed bodies, no concrete vaults, no biodegradable burial containers. I mean, I'm sorry, only biodegradable burial containers or shrouds, apologize. No upright monumentation that is polished and set in concrete, and most importantly, family participation. Uh, what does natural burial mean to the funeral community? You know, natural burial, and when I say funeral community, I mean the, the funeral directors and funeral homes. Natural burial is a progressive option that demonstrates care and understanding. Natural burial is a viable revenue source that truly helps heal both people and the planet. A uh, natural burial by participation creates a greater sense of acceptance of one's passing, allowing the families and friends to grieve and celebrate in a very personal way. Natural burial creates new opportunities, embracing a very old concept that has existed since the dawn of time. Uh, what does it mean for you know, the consumer or a family? A natural burial is the final statement in one's life and how they chose to live that. It's a true celebration of a life that was well lived through active participation in the funeral process for the family members. It creates a cathartic acceptance of one's passing by actively caring for your loved one as you did in life. Car carrying your loved one to the gravesite, lowering them, backfilling, allowing one life to transform to another. It's very moving. Uh, natural burial is a true stewardship for future generations, creating a recreational space for the living that honors those interred there, surrounding yourself with life, laughter, and nature as one passes the threshold of becoming one with the environment. What does it mean for the earth? Again, it's the ultimate form of stewardship. By becoming one with nature, you can create a carbon offset to the carbon footprint of a life that was lived, allowing nature and environment to do what it does best allowing its creation to become once more, only to be reborn as something new. That would bring me to my next subject, benefits of natural burial, spiritually and emotionally, recreationally and financially. A natural burial allows all human beings the benefit of spiritually knowing full acceptance of who you are with no judgment or bias. It allows one to be part of and taken back to one of the places that we all know to be true, which is nature. Nature knows no race, religion, sexuality. Natural burial is a resting in nature with full acceptance. Emotionally, it allows the grieving family to experience the true release of emotion through active participation, physical activity. Caring for a loved one in this intimate way allows for a greater form of acceptance of one's passing. Instead of being gripped and held hostage by grief, families are allowed to truly celebrate all that was most memorable of a life, of, of a life that their loved one had lived. 
Financially, it allows families to have the ability to choose an option that will not create a financial hardship for the living left behind. Traditional costs nationally are 12,000 plus. A natural burial uh, nationally on an average costs 5,000. These costs include uh, the cemetery, the service, the natural marker, the funeral director and burial products. It's a viable cost-effective option that rivals the affordability of a direct cremation, but also allows for ceremony, celebration and memorialization that is sometimes lost in that process. Environmentally, going back to the earth as we came, dust to dust, no increase in a carbon footprint, processes like hand dug graves, sustainable burial practices, allowing the earth to recycle you naturally as it has always done and was meant to be, realizing it's never, never too late to institute positive change, leading by example by stewarding the earth and others. That brings me to my next subject matter. Why choose a natural burial? Uh, to lay a loved one gently in the arms of nature allows for a rebirth that continues the chain of life and the living, creating a green recreational space to be used and enjoyed by the living, embracing community and history. The ultimate form of respect and dignity to bestow upon those who came before you and honor their contributions to the lives we live and the lives they lived building a true sense of community, stewardship, and responsibility to the earth we hold so dear, creating a cultural change to the future of funeral service and death as we have come to know it in today's world, unlocking a box inherently in all of our, our beings and DNA, allowing us to experience the acceptance of passing with no fear or regret, becoming in touch with who we are and what we have always been, acceptance of death and rebirth in nature. And that would bring me to my final sentiment, natural burial. You know, what can we do to help institute these changes? You know, what we need to do as a society is ask for the option, empower local funeral providers to create spaces and offer services. Educate, be the voice otherwise unheard, empower others and strengthen resolve that through positive actions will become positive change. Activism, encourage the, the conversations and lead by example. Empower others with your passion. And finally, become a friend of the GBC. Volunteer and utilize educational materials we offer freely and help change the world with a positive reinforcement of sustainable burial practices. I, I must say to this group that, you know, 15 years ago, I, I got into this by happenstance and it changed my life. Uh, I found a passion that I didn't know existed. I did not get formally schooled in the funeral profession, but what I found was something so moving, uh, so cathartic, so healing for people. It made all the sense in the world. There's very few things in life that you can say are a win-win across the board. This is a win for humanity. It's a win for our families. It's a win for our, our, our environment. It's a win for the funeral professional. It's a win for everybody. So I appreciate the time and please do visit the Green Burial Council website and learn more. And I do appreciate the, the blue sky eco-friendly funeral options that we talk about because it creates the conversation like we had tonight. So thank you, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Ed. And thank you, Dean and Ann. I really appreciated this. Uh, you know, for the, for the viewers who are watching, you need to understand that this is a discussion uh, with the Explorers Club. We're not actually, you know, this is not a marketing ploy. But what we are doing is we're having a conversation because we are directly involved with the environment, uh, the issues of climate change, sustainability, and the rest. It's, it's our bread and butter. We are the largest multidisciplinary field research group in the world. So this is, this is what we deal with. And given that our populations have grown literally exponentially, uh, we are going to be dealing with issues of burial for a very long period of time. Some of us, given my age, probably sooner than others, but nonetheless, uh, we're all going to get there at some point. So it behooves us to actually give us some serious consideration. So what you've had tonight are three interrelated but different 
uh, takes on the question of green burial and how these things are done. And we've touched upon a couple of very important topics, some of which have appeared as questions from some of the people who have been viewing this. And that includes such things as you did there, right there at the end, Ed, and I appreciate you doing that. Not all of the things that we're talking about are indeed available across the country. Uh, they are available, some things are more available in some places than others, but other places not yet at all. For instance, I have family out in Seattle, but I'm on the East Coast. I'm in Columbia, South Carolina. So the likelihood of my finding, you know, Anna's group here is fairly slim. And while I made a not particularly funny statement about composting with my daughters, uh, that was primarily to wind them up. Uh, the reality is that that's actually something very close. I come from, since the age of 15, being involved in traditional burial societies, no embalming, everything biodegradable, the whole nine yards, the intent that the body would return directly you know, to the soil, et cetera. So that's near and dear to my heart as well. And I understand Ed, how that becomes a passion. Trust me, we understand. I think all three of us or four of us here understand that. So the first question I have for you is, where are these things available? And you touched on the need to educate but you know, from your own experiences, fairly briefly, can you give us an idea of what it takes to get you know, local uh, funerary uh, customs, laws, et cetera, changed in those states where this doesn't exist yet? Uh, you know, kind of a, a, a quick manual handbook, if you will. So okay. whoever would like to take it off, uh, just kind of give me a, a clue. Anna, do you, would you like to go yes. for that? Yes, okay. I can speak to this. I lead public policy here at Recompose and it is extremely complicated to get laws changed. Um, regarding where alkaline hydrolysis is, that is probably the most recent one that's had the most process. As Dean said, it's legal in 21 states and there are funeral homes in a lot of states that offer it, but it's there are a lot of barriers to jump through. Like for example, alkaline hydrolysis was legalized in California in 2019, but there still aren't any providers that can do it there because the Department of Health hasn't finished their regulations. So there's a lot of different things that go into getting these options available in new states. For example, human composting is legal in Washington, Colorado, and Oregon now. And we attempted to get it passed also in California and New York this past session, but because of various different things, like in New York, it was a debate between the cemeteries and the funeral directors that caused this to not go forward. So it wasn't because anyone didn't want human composting. It was because of other bureaucracy. And in California, we have found out since that it was basically the chair of the committee was mad at the sponsor of our bill, and that's why it didn't pass. So it wasn't because anyone didn't want human composting. So we've hired some lobbyists, and we're hopeful in California, but it is, you know, we have people write to us all, every week asking, how can I bring this to my state? And the best thing to do is to write to your local state representative and tell them that you want this. That's how this got passed in Oregon. But there are quite a lot of barriers to getting this legalized. And on one hand, it makes sense because burial law is related to estates. It's related to criminal justice. You know, we, everyone wants that body handling to be respectful. However, in terms of consumer rights, it is way too hard to get new burial options legalized in my obviously biased opinion. Okay. Uh, D, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ed, would you like to, uh, be, be, with the GBC and the rest, I mean, this is part of your bread and butter. Would you like to go for it? Yeah, absolutely. What I would like to say is, uh, and, and the good news for natural burial is, natural burial is legal in all 50 states and pretty much worldwide. Uh, you know, the only rules and regulations that uh, are made concerning vaults and embalming are made uh, for requirements of health and safety. Uh, no state requires embalming, but they do require embalming after a certain period of time if a, if a body has not been refrigerated or proper, properly handled. So typically 48 hours, you have 48 hours to be refrigerated. That's when the clock starts to tick. And uh, concrete vaults are just the requirement of a cemetery itself. We at the Green Burial Council have 400 providers now and this is the beauty of natural burial. Every single cemetery in this country has the ability to offer it and they already do it, but it was known as a different thing. It was called simple burial and it was reserved for individuals who were of very poor means. And they've been doing it for a very long time and, and almost every cemetery has one of these sections. So the good news is when it comes to natural burial, 
You know, you can have it. And the way you can get it is you don't have to lobby anyone. You have to go to your local funeral home and your local cemetery and tell them why they should offer these services and how beneficial they'll be to the community. Okay, let me throw something in on top of that, since one of the questions was, you know, are there any cultures around that do the basic burial, the, the green burial? And you've just, it was a perfect segue because Judaism and Islam both have simple burials here in the United States, have always had simple burials in the United States. It's exactly what they do. Uh, same thing's true for Baha'i and some other groups out there. So as Ed is pointing out, in terms of unembalmed, simple, degradable burials, yeah, that is that is available everywhere. And some people then ask the next question, which is why I'm looking at you, Dean, though it's hard for you to tell from the screen. A person asked on the question of water cremation, aquamation, uh, where is that available? And Anna was kind enough to point out it's in 21 states, but perhaps you could give us some more information on that as well. Sure. Th yeah, th th there's approximately 50 fu different funeral homes across the United States that actually offer this in the different states. And, and uh, I think the easiest way to probably do it without making this an infomercial or anything like that is you could probably Google it, you know, and you, and you can find whether or not a, your state, and I know um, the Cremation Association of North America actually has a website where you can go and you can see which states are legal to see if your state is legal or not. And then the other the other thing you can do is you can, if your state is legal, you can see if anyone in your state is providing it. But um, to be honest with you, I've seen pe people and that have flown their loved one from one state to another state or driven it just to have this process done. So, so even if your state doesn't offer it, that doesn't mean it, it, you can't do it. It just means there's some transportation costs involved with getting it done is all. Thanks, Dean. I really appreciate that. Yeah, people need to know that angel flights don't only occur with the military. Right. Uh, that both uh, that there are any number of uh, commercial uh, companies which one has to double check and be very careful with, but there are other ways, other transportation formats that can go in. One thing I would not suggest is simply taking traditional cremains and running them through the postal service. There have been some issues, at least uh, by discussion versus quantitative fact uh, about that in the past. Uh, one of the people has raised an issue about ritual and religion. Uh, and I thought did a very nice job on pointing that one out uh, for, you know, the version of, uh, of Green Bureau that they've been dealing with. Uh, I think that Ed did as well. Uh, Dean, can you give us some uh, some background on how ritual and the rest fits in with uh, in with your you know with alkaline hydrolysis? If About, you mean the ritual of burial, you mean itself? Yeah, with Edward, I mean you know, there are people come to the you know graveside and people are buried very traditional burial, really when you get down to it. Right, uh, right. I mean, you can things. still, yeah, you can still have a visitation the night before if you want to have a visitation where you can see the body. You can have a, fu a full funeral, and then instead of going to the cemetery, you go to the alkaline hydrolysis facility or the crematory and have the body cremated, and then you can take the body back to the cemetery at a later date, and you can you can purchase a niche, and you can you can go to the cemetery if you want that, or you can scatter. You know, it's, it's it's up to you, whatever you decide you want to do, or up to the individual, I guess, and carrying out their wishes. So, I mean, the, the process, there's no DNA left with alkaline hydrolysis, and they're completely sterile, just so you're aware of that. So, okay. So basically, yeah, what we're talking- Thanks for that, Dean. Um, I, I just want to say here, Jonathan, that this is no, something that we've heard of too. You know, a lot of folks say like, oh, turning my grandma into dirt is it respectful and we've done a lot of work to message it as this is actually natural it's beautiful and i have you know this alkaline hydrolysis idea too of why would someone think cremation was still spiritual but alkaline hydrolysis was not um, and there are a lot of great people doing good work like there's a group called be a tree cremation in colorado and she calls the effluent that's created from it tree tea and she donates it to a flower farm so there are ways that this can be beautiful and meaningful and something that i repeat often as i'm working with lawmakers and people who aren't familiar with these death care options is anything can be beautiful you know like where does this idea of traditional come from and we don't want to tell anyone what can be meaningful so 
all of these can be a beautiful way to honor your person. And, and Jonathan, could I make one statement too? Please. And, 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 uh, and to follow up, Anna, you know, the, the problem with people sometimes is they don't want to discuss, you know, obviously death is not a conversation people want to discuss. But when it comes down to it, you know, this is America and it's land of the free and we have free, free choice. And really what it comes down to is processes. So as long as a family understands a process, no matter what it is, traditional, uh, natural organic reduction, acclimation, as long as it's a transparent process that they understand, then they're willingly taking that, you know, they're, they're accepting that and saying that's what we want. So at the end of the day, people can say anything they wish, but you know, really it comes down to personal choice. And as long as they have a clear picture as to what they're getting, then that's the beauty of living in America. You can, you can make that choice. Couldn't say it better myself, Ed, and I'm glad you did. And I'm glad that Anna brought it up as well, because that's very true. Although we're discussing these here, there's no requirement for anybody to do them, at least not currently, that's for sure. Uh, so it's a question of choice and a question of what you're comfortable with. And of course, we all know that for the most part, burials are for the survivors. Uh, for the most part, the person who is now deceased doesn't seem to have much of a vote. At least I very rarely see the hand come up. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it, is become, it is a family decision. And I think we would all encourage people to have this conversation. Uh, it should be a conversation that people should be having. You don't want to leave these things for the last possible second. Uh, because then things can get off the rails and people are not in a good place from the end of it. And end of life decisions can be a means of moving people forward. The statement that we use for the uh, for this program actually comes from the Explorers Club recognition when an explorer has passed. Uh, our different chapters, our branches meet uh, routinely internationally, and we have a roll call basically of those who have passed on, and we are all upstanding and we say on to higher exploration. There's a moment of silence. Silence. So when we were talking about this uh, as a title, on to higher exploration, personal recycling, it not only covered the traditions of the club, which have been around for a very long period of time uh, in terms of exploration of the club itself, but also to the question again to a kinder, gentler, sustainable, green uh, use of the environment and the rest, which frankly all of us are heavily dependent on whether we're explorers or not. So I would like to, uh, unless there, there's no questions, are there questions from the panel to the panel from uh, from each of you? I mean, I'm not sure how often you three actually get together to sit here. Uh, so if you have a question for each other, which would be, you know, something you actually would like to know, uh, this is probably a good opportunity to, to raise the issue. Uh, frankly, I found it fascinating for all of it. Uh, very informative and I think very useful. Uh, hopefully the people who have been watching us have as well. So I'm going to open it. Do you have a question for each other? Uh, I, I don't particularly have a question. I mean, we at the Green Burial Council tried to stay up on all of the options and, and what they mean. And we're looking at new certification programs for future certification of what we feel like are eco-friendly funeral options. So I feel like I understand both processes fairly well. Okay. Well, that's fair. Uh, in that case, what I'm going to do is let you know, uh, first off, how much I appreciated the fact that you took time from your busy schedules to do this. I know that some of you literally had to scramble from one thing to another. We're in different time zones. Uh, as usual for the pandemic, we're on Zoom. Someday we'll be off Zoom. Maybe we can actually show up in the same place and, and have some tea or coffee or something together. That'd be great. Uh, but I'd like to thank all three of you for this. I think it was extraordinarily informative. Uh, there were some good questions. I'm glad that your information will be made available so people can contact you directly. And I encourage people to contact you three directly. Uh, and then I'd also like to point out that uh, next week, uh, Monday's lecture, uh, will be the Westbound Rower, the first crossing of the Pacific Ocean streaming live, live from the middle of the ocean with Erd and Urk, uh, who is in a rowing expedition as we speak in his single person rowing set in the Pacific Ocean. Wow. So again, better him than me. Uh, <laughs> none of us do the same forms of exploration. 
I'm an archaeologist. He's a rower. That's pretty cool. How often do you get those two people in the same room to talk about things? So next week, Monday, if you have the opportunity to be here, I would encourage it. And every Monday thereafter, when we have a program. Uh, and I, again, like to thank our panelists for this evening. Thank you all very much. And I will leave it to the Explorers Club to, uh, to pipe us out. So thank you all again. Thank, thank you. you, Jonathan. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Anna.